Welcome to Timeless Tales, History, and Folklore. I'm Dea Nara, your host. If you're intrigued by tales, history, and folklore, whether it's imaginary or real, subscribe and press the notification bell so that you'll be notified each time I upload a new video. With the holiday season upon us, I wanted to further explore the topic of Christmas and some of its folklore. In today's video, I'll be talking about terrifying characters in Christmas traditions that target children. Now, while this video is about children, it's not recommended for children. Viewer discretion is advised. All of this folklore revolves around the threat that if children aren't always on their best behavior, that they'll be punished during the holiday season. The idea of scaring children so that they'll behave is archaic and an outdated practice. Either way, let's get started. First, we have Grilla, a hideous ogre. Her story originates from the 1600s. Some call her a troll, others call her a witch. She is wife to an elderly man and mother to 13 adult Yule males. She hails from Iceland and lives in a cave in the mountains where there isn't much to eat. She sends her 13 deviant sons down the mountain and into town. Once they make their way down and arrive in town, they go looking for the naughty children, kidnap them, bring them back up the mountain so that Grilla could cook them in a Christmas stew. If for some reason children weren't available, she's perfectly content with feasting on fully grown men as long as she could have her Christmas stew. Grilla also has a massive black cat called Yule Cat who only eats once a year. He also goes into town and watches the children from outside their windows unwrap their Christmas gifts. If that child didn't receive clothing because of bad behavior, he'd wait for the right moment, make his way inside, and gobble them up. Next, we have Pierre Fouitard. This tale is derived from France, Belgium, and Switzerland. There are a few versions of this tale. The most popular one takes place in 1150, where Pierre is described as being disheveled, haggardly, creepy looking, with messy hair, and a long white scraggly beard. He was a butcher and an innkeeper. Both Pierre and his wife noticed three well-dressed boys that appeared to come from wealthy families. Upon noticing this, they kidnapped the three boys by luring them with wine with the objective of robbing them. Instead, they ended up torturing, slitting their throats, and killing them. They chopped them up into little pieces, salted them, and placed them in a tub. St. Nicholas, upon this discovery, miraculously put these cut up pieces back together and resurrects the boys, bringing them back to their families. St. Nicholas placed the innkeeper in chains, forcing him into service in order to make penance for his sinful behavior. Pierre, after having repented for his sin, was later known as Le Pierre Fouitard. He took a vow to partner up with St. Nicholas. Pierre is one of many who accompanies St. Nicholas on December 6th as he visits the homes of children. Now, while St. Nicholas rewards the well-behaved children with gifts, Pierre spanks the naughty ones. So next we have Hans Trapp or Hans Trott from the 1400s, who was from Alsace-Lorraine, France. He was rich and very powerful feared by all the locals. He was known for his merciless behavior, greed, and unscrupulous nature in matters of business. 
This resulted in him getting excommunicated from the church, and as a result, he lost all of his wealth and social standing within the community. His thirst for power was so great that he used witchcraft and made a deal with the devil in order to enhance his power and status. Banished from all good society, he ends up living in the woods. He'd dress up as a scarecrow with straw stuffed into his clothing, while sometimes wearing a black cloak. He did this because he becomes obsessed with the idea of consuming human flesh. He ends up luring a shepherd boy into the woods, kills and cooks him over a fire. Right before he was about to eat him, God had had enough and struck him with a lightning bolt, splitting his head wide open. Although Hans died as a result of being struck down, he's been known to show up on Christmas Day, going from door to door looking for children to eat. This legend was actually inspired by the real Hans von Trotha, who lived from 1450 to 1503. He was a German knight and marshal of the Prince Elector of the Palatine. He commanded two castles, but became embroiled in an argument with the church over the property in one of them. As you can see, quite a few of these traditions are rooted in some form of cannibalism, both disturbing and alarming. Now let's talk about Krampus. This character originated during the 12th century and the most well-known of these horrifying traditions. The story of Krampus is shared by Austria, Croatia, Northern Italy, and Slovenia, but originated in German folklore. He is the evil counterpart and another one of many companions to St. Nicholas. He is a large black demon half goat, half monster with large claws and an extremely long tongue who punishes naughty children at Christmas. He lurks about with a cowbell and chains to warn people that he's approaching. The chains suggest that he is bound to the devil. His name is derived from the German word Krampen, which means claw. He carries birch branches, which he uses to whack the children. He then throws them in his sack and drags them to his lair, some say to hell. There's no certainty as to what he does after that, but he is terrifying. St. Nicholas's other partners are Schmutzli from Switzerland, a dirty bearded man who carries a broom, a whip of sticks, and a large sack. He threatened naughty children with kidnapping or some form of violence. Then there's Belschnickel, a vagabond who gives well-behaved children with sweet treats and beats the naughty ones. Then finally, we have Pierre Buitard and Hans Trapp, both from France, who I've already mentioned. These monstrous companions descend upon unruly children and punishes them in the harshest ways, while St. Nicholas rewards the good children. Now, why would a saint, who's supposed to be benevolent, have companions such as these? Some origins say that he forces these villains to do his bidding, and that while they serve him, evil will not have the last word. But if he is associating with these villains, isn't evil having the last word in harming children by beating them? What kind of saint consorts with miscreants who are too willing to hurt children? Isn't a saint supposed to be the example of wholeness, holiness, and closeness to God? I have to question the ethics of St. Nicholas because of the company he keeps. Either way, let's continue with last but not least, we have the grotesque Frau Perta, the Christmas witch from the 10th century, also known as the belly slitter. 
The tale of Frau Perta comes from Austria, Germany, and Bavaria. She's dressed in white rags and has a big nose made of iron. She resembles an old haggardly crone and carries a long knife hidden under her skirt. For those of you not familiar with a crone, a crone is a wise woman characterized as disagreeable, malicious, or sinister in manner, often with supernatural associations who can either be helpful or obstructive, similar to a witch. Frau Perta or Frau Berta would go around to see which children have been naughty and which have been nice. If they've been naughty, she slices open their bellies and stuffs them with rocks and straw. I'm not sure of what the purpose of doing this is, but I guess the threat of it can be terrifying. It's obvious that all of these traditions revolve around terrifying children so that they'll be good and well-behaved. It is an unrealistic standard for a child. As human beings, we use our emotions for many things, such as enjoyment, creativity, imagination, focus, thinking, and problem-solving. This helps us to learn about taking in the world outside of us and about ourselves. Our emotions can affect our behavior and how we're feeling at any given moment. Young children are still learning and haven't mastered how to work through their emotions. It's critical that we give them space and the freedom to explore them. The old ways of using the boogeyman to get children to behave is not really effective or realistic and can actually do more harm than good. This can leave a negative imprint in a child's mind that could leave a lasting effect on their mental health into adulthood. Lying undermines their ability to process their emotions and work through them. It only teaches them to lie to engage in self-serving behaviors and to avoid real-life challenges rather than face them. It doesn't give them the problem-solving skills needed for adulthood and social challenges. It's always better to be honest and truthful rather than do what is easy. Honesty truly is the best policy. My own experience has shown me that using positive reinforcement is the best strategy to get children to behave over scaring them to death. While these traditions from the distant past can be seen as entertaining and intriguing, they are reminiscent of just that, the past, and show us the culmination and evolution of child rearing in modern society. These customs were meant to encourage children to be good and deserving of their Christmas gifts but came with a dark side, the punishment that they'd receive from a monster if they weren't good. We need courage and the insight to learn from the past and not live in it. You cannot raise your children as your parents raised you because your parents raised you in a world that no longer exists. Let me know what your thoughts are on these old-time, horrifying traditions and comment down below. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. Happy Holidays and thank you so much for watching.